there's a killer in the deserts and coastlines of the United States, and if you're not careful, you'll disappear with just one wrong step and be lost forever. Lake Michigan 2013 Six-year-old Nathan Wester and his family are enjoying the surf and sun in the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, a popular getaway for local families. For thousands of years, the winds and waves of Lake Michigan have steadily deposited a rising landscape of sand dunes, making the place look more like the Saharan Desert location than the shore of one of America's most famous Great Lakes. The most impressive feature, though, is the steep 126-foot Mount Baldy, a massive sand dune that towers above all the rest. As families and their children play all along its edges and try to summit the mini mountain of sand, they have no idea that a deadly booby trap has been laying in wait for centuries. Long, long ago, this stretch of shore was covered with trees, much like the rest of Lake Michigan. When the sand began to pile up, though, it slowly choked the trees to death. One particularly massive tree held on longer than the rest, until it too succumbed to the rising sand. After an untold number of years, the tree was completely covered by the massive sand dune, and the wood within rotted away from the lakeside moisture seeping through the sand. What remained in its place is a massive cavity with a small cap of sand atop it, a perfect trap waiting to be sprung, a trap that would wait centuries before claiming its victim. Little Nathan and his father Greg joined family friend Keith Carrow and his son Colin on an impromptu climb to the top of Mount Baldy. The boys rush ahead as little boys do and begin to eagerly chase each other up the massive sand dune. Neither of the fathers are on guard, they have nothing to fear. Families have been playing here for decades, after all, and what danger could a massive sand dune possibly hold after all? They let the boys rush up ahead of them, chatting amongst themselves as they slowly follow suit. The perfect day on the beach is about to take a horrifying turn. Nathan and Colin play fight as they run up the sand dune, and then suddenly Nathan vanishes right in front of Colin's eyes. After all these years, Nathan has finally managed to do it. He's triggered the deadly booby trap of Mount Baldy. One wrong step and Nathan vanishes in a plume of sand, leaving behind only a small hole. Colin can't believe his eyes, and then in a panic rushes down the dune, yelling out that Nathan has vanished. The fathers are confused, but they look up to where Colin is pointing and see the impression left in the sand. He fell in this hole, shouts Colin. Cold terror grips them. The men begin to pound up the sand dune, reaching the hole seconds later. The men try to look down into the hole, but all they see is darkness. They call out to Nathan and hear a muffled reply, I'm scared. They reach their arms down into the hole but feel nothing but empty air. In a growing panic, the men begin to look around for rope or driftwood, literally anything they can use to reach down into the cavity, but there's nothing around them except sand dunes. The men now start to dig desperately, shoving away handfuls of very loose sand. This isn't like the regular sand, years of wear by wind and waves have made it very fine and smooth, causing friction to barely hold it together. As the men dig, more of the sand slips down the sides and into the hole. Now the men realize that they run the risk of burying Nathan alive and try to widen the hole to lessen how much sand slides back in. It's no use though, the men must dig to reach Nathan trapped somewhere in the darkness below them, but digging only means more sand gets poured down the same hole, sand that's slowly starting to cover up the trapped Nathan, who's stuck in the heart of this mountain of sand. Then their worst nightmare happens. The sand dune suffers a catastrophic collapse. In an instant, tons of sand rush into the hole, completely burying Nathan with a final whimper. There's barely an indentation left on the face of the dune to signal where Nathan's been lost or where the men have been furiously digging. The two fathers are dumbfounded, then quickly recover and begin once more to furiously dig. Meanwhile, Colin has run down the dune and found Nathan's mother, Faith, running in a blind panic. Faith doesn't understand what Colin's telling her, but she knows that something is seriously wrong. She rushes up to the sand dune and discovers Keith and Greg digging. She understands exactly what's going on long before Greg comes running toward her to tell her that the sands have swallowed up Nathan. 911 is called. Dispatchers are baffled. She dispatches the fire department, but it's going to be a long time before they can get there. In the meantime, the three dig, now joined by Keith's wife. It's no use though. The more they dig, the more they disturb the sand dune, causing sand to slide down from the top of the dune and undo all of their hard work. They've been at it for 15 minutes now and barely made a hole more than a few inches deep. Police, firefighters, and paramedics begin to show up. There's confusion. Nobody's sure exactly what's going on. Some of the first responders have rope, assuming that the boy simply fell into a hole. They're horrified to discover that Nathan hasn't just fallen into a hole. He's fallen straight into the heart of Mount Baldy and been swallowed alive by sand. Well, alive is a relative term by now. It's been half an hour since Nathan's been buried by tons of sand. Nobody on the scene says it, but everyone's thinking it. Nathan is likely gone by now. Still, the police, EMS, and firefighters join the effort, furiously digging by hand and refusing to give up on Nathan. Faith begins to pray, asking God to give Nathan an air pocket to survive in. 
Others join her, praying through gritted teeth as they try to move several tons of sand with nothing but their bare hands and brute determination. Finally, an hour after Nathan was buried alive, firefighters with shovels begin to show up. The men work in shifts, furiously digging into the massive sand dune. To avoid having the sand pour in and erase all their work, they widen the hole, but it's of little use. Another hour has gone by and the men have barely dug five feet. There is no sign of Nathan anywhere. Still, nobody wants to believe it, but everyone knows it. They are now officially looking for a body. That doesn't stop or slow their efforts, though, and the emergency personnel throw themselves the task of digging with everything they've got. Faith continues praying, just one miracle, just one miracle, and she'll never ask for anything more again. It's been over two hours and finally some heavy equipment has made it on scene. An excavator has arrived and begins to make its trek up the sand dunes. The powerful machine digs its treads into the sand as the incline rises steeply, but even its powerful engine is no match for the loose sand. With hearts sinking in their chests, the rescuers and Nathan's friends and family watch as the excavator is forced to turn back. It'll be of no use here. Nevertheless, the men continue to dig, even though they're getting demoralized by the sand continuing to rush into the hole. It's three steps forward and two steps back. Sometimes, though, the sand is particularly cruel, and on those occasions it's five steps back, as hundreds of pounds of sand rushes to fill the hole made by the rescue effort. Now, a tracked backhoe appears, a little lighter and more agile than the big excavator. However, the sand makes it impossible for the machine to get to the top, its tread slipping and sliding on the infuriatingly loose sugar sand of Mount Baldy. That won't stop this driver, though, and if he can't drive to the top, he'll simply pull himself. The driver maneuvers the backhoe like an expert, plunging it deep into the sand, then using the powerful engine to literally pull the backhoe up the side of the massive dune. After four hours, the backhoe is finally in position to begin digging. Faith is nearly hysterical at this point. Her nerves have been shot by watching the fine sand fill in all the hard work the rescuers do. When the backhoe is in position, she screams out that they're going to chop Nathan in half with a massive scoop. The rescue workers try to calm her down, and one of them takes a large rod and begins to prod the sand. Only after meticulously but quickly checking several feet of sand, the OK is given for the backhoe to move into action. The big machine is finally winning the fight against Mount Baldy, but it's forced to dig only two inches at a time to avoid accidentally hitting Nathan's buried body. Greg and Faith are encouraged to leave the rescue site and return to the police station with a patrol car. There, they're giving blankets to cover themselves with. They're still in their swimwear, and dusk is approaching. The police try to comfort the distraught pair, promising that every effort's being made to recover Nathan. None of the police officers mentions that, at this point, they're looking for a body to at least give the grieving family a chance to say goodbye. Nobody knows if they can find the body, though, given the incredible size of the sand dune. Nathan might be lost forever. Their family's last memories of the little boy being him calling out for help from beneath several feet of sand. Back at the rescue site, though, the probe finally strikes something solid. Carefully, the backhoe is maneuvered to slowly scrape away several inches of sand. The probe confirms that they're nearing a solid object, what must be Nathan. The men dig with their bare hands, but suddenly the sand shifts and Nathan slips even deeper into the sand dune. The backhoe is put to work once more, quickly but delicately digging away at tons of sand. Finally, a firefighter brushes away a layer of sand and sees the blonde hair on the top of Nathan's head. He begins to frantically dig, praying that the effort doesn't cause him to simply sink further. Finally, he manages to uncover Nathan down to his armpits, and with a furious effort, he and a few others pull Nathan free. The firefighter who found him fights back his own grief. Nathan reminds him of his own little boy. Nathan is unresponsive. The firefighters wipe the sand off of Nathan's face and cheeks for breath. Nothing. He puts an ear to his chest, hoping against hope to hear a heartbeat. Once more, nothing. They won't give up, though. Not after this much fighting. Nathan is passed down the side of the dune from man to man and rushed to a lifeguard truck, then to a waiting ambulance. Kicking up gravel, the ambulance immediately rushes to the hospital, the paramedics trying to insert a breathing tube to begin to manually force oxygen into Nathan's lungs. But his lungs are full of sand. They barely manage to get any air into his tiny body, but keep trying anyway. Things look very grim. Aside from not breathing, Nathan is freezing cold. At a depth of approximately 20 feet, the sand retains the icy cold temperatures of Lake Michigan, turning it into a refrigerator. But modern medical science has a rule. You're not dead until you're warm and dead. There's still a chance, no matter how faint. Nathan's parents are told their little boy has been found, and a police unit rushes them to the hospital. Doctors won't tell them what's going on, though. They have no idea if Nathan is alive or not. They piece together that he was found unresponsive, but they aren't sure what that actually means. Behind closed doors, doctors are furiously working to save Nathan. They have room to hope. On the way to the hospital, Nathan had suddenly begun to bleed, likely from a cut on his forehead. This was evidence of a heartbeat. 
Incredibly, the icy sand had actually worked to save Nathan's life, lowering his body temperature to the point that his body required little oxygen to survive. But coming back to consciousness is another thing entirely. As doctors vacuum sand out of his lungs and stomach, they fear that Nathan's brain has been starved of oxygen for so long that it suffered irreparable damage. All that could be left of Nathan is the most basic of brain functions – heart beating, lungs breathing, and nothing more. Then suddenly, Nathan regains consciousness. His parents are told that their boy is not only alive but actually speaking. It's nothing short of an outright miracle, and one that will continue to defy the odds. Within two weeks, Nathan will be home and playing with his siblings, with absolutely zero lingering side effects. Now, go check out Trapped in a Collapsed Mind for 69 days, or click this other video instead.